To a musician, there is only one alternative to believing that music is of divine origin, and that is to believe that nothing is. This is the opening of a 1922 essay by the now largely forgotten musicologist Clement Antrobus Harris. But just consider for a moment what it is about the musical experience that Harris is trying to get at. To a musician, there is only one alternative to believing that music is of divine origin, and that is to believe that nothing is. In ancient Egyptian mythology, music was said to have been invented by the god Thoth. One day he found the shell of a dead tortoise that had washed up on the banks of the Nile. The fierce heat of the sun had dried the flesh, leaving the sinews bare and the tendons contracted from desiccation. He found that when he struck them, they produced a sound. And so, out of the remains of the tortoise, he fashioned the first lyre, the harp of the ancient world. Now, as well as being the inventor of music, Thoth was also the god of knowledge, of wisdom and logic, and also of magic and secrets and mysteries. He was the inventor of writing and of the sciences and of theology and rituals, and he was also the protector of scribes and magicians. Now to the modern mind it might seem strange that all of these should go together. Since the Enlightenment in the West there has been an attempt to separate those aspects of culture which are seen as rational from those which are seen as irrational. This modern distinction is, to a large extent, artificial and a fiction. Our very beliefs about what is and isn't rational come out of pre-rational and pre-conscious mental processes. The tip of the iceberg does not exist in isolation from what lies below the surface. However, the idea that there is a clear distinction between the rational and the irrational has become so entrenched in popular culture that it is worth taking a moment to try and look at how these might be much more closely related. In a sense, we could say that Thoth is an ancient god of art, but we have to understand this word in a much larger sense than we normally do now. This is not just art in the way in which today we might say the art of music or the art of writing, but also in more ancient phrases, such as the art of war, or the art of agriculture or irrigation. For a modern audience, a better word might be artifice, which has connotations of something that is creative, but also to a certain extent fictitious. A construction, either physical or of the mind. The domain of Thoth, the world of artifice and invention, what we might call culture, is the world of the mind, a world of ideas, inventions and symbols by which we understand and shape the world we inhabit. In the writings of the pre-enlightenment world, we often find an understanding of culture and human intellect that often seems more subtle and ambiguous than we do now. Consider language. Without language, we cannot communicate or express our thoughts. And yet, once you have language, you can also lie and obscure and confuse. And this is true in a way of all culture. The same creativity that allows us to imagine an infinity of different ways of seeing and comprehending reality also gives us the ability to deceive and to corrupt, and often even to confuse ourselves. The worlds we inhabit are labyrinths of symbols and structures, like a collective dream. They are worlds that we made, but do not fully understand. We remain forever just beyond our own reach. We try to gain knowledge of ourselves, to know what we are. But the very process by which we do this changes what we are. One of the byproducts of the history of this accidental and haphazard human journey has been the emergence of what we might call a distinct self. We do not simply 
look out at the world from where we stand. We also look back at ourselves. Everything that we encounter and interact with shapes our image of the world, but also of ourselves. Over time, we have come to identify with our minds and to see ourselves as rational beings. But this image of the self is clearly not what we are. It is just another idea within the deep and strange world of our mind, which itself is just one part of what we are. And this idea of humans as rational, logical beings is in many ways a simplification and a reduction of humanity, just as systems of logic are a simplification and a formalization of the much more complex and nebulous and intuitive world of human thought. Whatever else a perfectly rational and logical being might be, they would not be human. What need would a system of purely logical input-output functions have for music? On the one hand, the study of musical harmonies lends itself to mathematical inquiry and rational analysis, which would seem to bring music within the domain of the conscious intellect. And yet these mathematical representations do not capture what actually happens when we listen to music. Music moves us in ways that cannot really be put into words, and it touches parts of us that lie just beyond the grasp of our rational intellect. If you have ever tried to describe a piece of music to someone who hasn't heard it, you know that your words will never be able to contain or convey the experience itself. All you can do is tell them to go listen to it for themselves. The experience of music occurs below or beyond or before the explicitly conscious. As many have pointed out, the conscious mind, the world of thought, is a world of symbols and ideas. But music does not mean something in the way that a symbol points to something other than itself. It simply is something. We listen to the music for the music. Because of the great impact that music undeniably has on us, it has been seen across many cultures as a way of developing inner harmony and clarity of thought and of focusing the mind. It has equally been used as a tool for propaganda or as a way of stirring and manipulating emotions, most recently as a tool for marketing. With the same ease with which it can clear the mind, it can also persuade and sway our judgment. On the one hand, we find it described as the noblest of the arts, whose contemplation elevates the mind. And yet on the other, there are countless examples of forms of music being described as corrupting influences, especially on the youth, causing listeners to lose their inhibitions, unleashing primitive and unchecked emotions, leading to all kinds of debauchery. Think of how, over the last hundred years or so, jazz, rock and hip-hop have all been described as the music of the devil, and we find similar reactions to musics even thousands of years ago. Now it is worth noting that these two seemingly opposite aspects of music, the noble and the corrupt, share a fundamental feature. In both cases, what is happening is that the listeners are in a sense transcending the mental world of symbols and conventions they usually inhabit that governs the way they act, the role they play within society, the interactions that they have, and the way that they see themselves and others. Music projects the conscious mind into spaces it doesn't normally go. And transcendence is a funny thing. Within conventional society, it is viewed at once with reverence, but also with derision or mistrust. Just think of the ambivalent relationship that societies often have with the mystics in their midst. So maybe now we start to glimpse why, in many cultures, music has often been described as a bridge 
as if suspended between worlds, between the material and the spiritual, between the intellectual and the pre-rational, between the noble and the corrupt. Not unlike the human mind. Anyway, in Egypt, Thoth was said to be the inventor of music, but there were also other gods that were commonly depicted as playing musical instruments, reflecting the multifaceted nature of the musical experience. Hathor, a goddess of joy and motherhood and fertility, was often associated with music and dance. The protectors of the household, Bess and Beset, were also divinities with a strong affinity for music, and it was customary for the image of Bess to be tattooed on the leg of a musician or a dancer during the age of the New Kingdom. Isis was also associated with music, in particular with funeral chants due to having buried and subsequently resurrected her husband Osiris. Osiris himself was associated with song. In fact, it was the figure of Osiris accompanying himself with nine maidens skilled in the arts of music and dance, which when it was encountered by the Greeks, they interpreted him as being Apollo. This is what is known as a syncretism. A syncretism is in essence when the people of one culture encounter the god of another culture, and by noting certain similarities between the two, they come to see both as being different aspects of the same god. For example, when the Romans encountered Greek culture, they understood the Greek god Zeus as being another form of their sky god Jupiter. Now in Greece, Apollo was the sun god and the god of music. He sung and played the lyre and was often accompanied in this by the nine muses. Now the muses were the nine daughters of memory a titaness, one of those ancestral beings who had existed since before even the gods themselves. Being the daughters of memory, we find here again, in a more explicit form, the idea that art is the domain of the mind. In fact, this is a good way of thinking of the ancient Greek term musike, which is different both from our modern understanding of music and also of art. The Greeks made quite a distinction between what they considered to be the arts of the mind versus manual skills or crafts. For example, among the nine muses, alongside music and dance and poetry, tragedy and comedy, we find other arts that we wouldn't necessarily think of as such today, like history or astronomy. On the other hand, we don't find disciplines which today we do consider arts, such as sculpture, which the Greeks considered more of a manual skill than a mental one. Now, Greek mythology tells that during the reign of chaos that predated the triumph of Zeus, there was no music. And when Rhea hid the baby Zeus on the island of Crete so that he might escape being eaten alive by his father Kronos, the inhabitants of Crete, the Curetes, danced savagely while banging their shields and crashing cymbals so as to drown out the cries of the newborn Zeus. This is presented not so much as music, but as a noise like the raging of a storm. Now there may be something to this image. Many ethnomusicologists and biomusicologists have speculated that war musics may have been one of the earliest forms of music made by prehistoric humans. So this image of primordial men banging their shields and shouting savagely could be something of an echo of a very distant past. However, as far as I know, there isn't any literature out there that attempts to draw a connection between the two. So this is purely my own speculation. So don't quote me on that. Either way, you have to admit it's a very striking image. Another story tells us that much later, after Zeus had grown up and subdued Kronos and had come to rule over the earth, he fell in love with Leto and conceived a child with her. Needless to say, Hera, his wife, was not happy with this, 
and in her fury she pursued Leto, who took refuge on a deserted rock lost at sea, and there she gave birth to Apollo. Apollo, being a sun god and a child of Zeus, who was the father of the gods and a personification of intellect, was himself the light of that intellect, that is, truth and reason. And so it was that with the coming into the world of the light of reason, so too, like a piercing brilliance, music came into the world where once there had only been noise. Now the image of music being associated with the sun or with the solar deity is one that we find again and again, sometimes in cultures so distantly related that it seems reasonable to imagine that the stories originated independently. Two principal figures of Central American Aztec mythology are the deities Tezcatlipoca and Quetzalcoatl. Tezcatlipoca, the smoking mirror, had associations with the earth, with the night sky and the cosmos, and he can be understood as being the phenomenal world that we perceive with the senses. Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, manifested as the wind and was associated with wisdom. He can be understood as the world of the spirit, of the mind, and in a sense of the reality that lies beyond the world simply as it appears to our senses. One day, when Tetzcatlipoca was walking on earth, he called Quetzalcoatl to him, who at the time had taken the form of the wind. When he arrived, Tetzcatlipoca told him to listen. So Quetzalcoatl quieted his roaring and listened, but he could hear nothing. Then Tetzcatlipoca said, Wind, the earth is sick from silence. And though we possess light and colour and fruit, yet we have no music. We must bestow music upon all creation. And he then proceeded to tell him about the musicians that lived with the sun. Go then through the boundless sadness between the blue smoke and the spaces to the high house of the sun. There the father sun is surrounded by makers of music who blow their flutes sweetly and with their burning choir scatter light abroad. So Quetzalcoatl went to the sun and called the musicians to come forth so that he might bring them to earth. But the sun had told them to remain silent and hide, so none answered. The entire cosmos was silent. Again the wind called in his dark voice, and again the musicians remained silent. And so Quetzalcoatl became angry, and from his bottomless throat came the roar of thunder. The translation I have here describes it like this. Flocks of clouds whose blackened wombs were stabbed and torn with lightning, assembled to besiege the house of the sun. Now spurred by fear at this sight, some of the musicians ran to the wind's lap for shelter, and immediately Quetzalcoatl's anger vanished, and he brought the musicians back to earth. This is how it is described in the myth. Bearing them gently, lest he should harm their tender melodies, the wind with that tumult of happiness in his arms set out on his downward journey, generous and contented. Below, earth raised its wide dark eyes to heaven, and its great face shone, and it smiled. And the arms of the trees were uplifted, there greeted the wind's wanderers, the awakened voice of its people, the wings of the Quetzal birds, the face of the flowers, and the cheeks of the fruit. When all the flutter of happiness landed on earth, and the sun's musicians spread to the four quarters, then wind ceased his complaining and sang, caressing the valleys, the forests, and seas. Thus music was born on the bosom of the earth, thus did all things learn to sing, the awakening dawn, the dreaming man, the waiting mother, 
the passing water and the flying bird. Life was all music from that time on. Now the reference to the awakening dawn draws comparisons which we find in almost all cultures between the sounds of the dawn chorus and human music. And we are also told earlier in the myth that the musicians that played in the sun's court were all dressed in bright colours. The text states that there were no musicians of the colour of darkness. In other words, there were no sad songs while the musicians played in the house of the sun. Sad music came into existence once the musicians gave their craft to humans. We might understand this to mean that mournful songs, the laments that give voice to deep sorrows, are in a sense the most human of the forms of music. It is also worth noting that in the myth, both Tezcatlipoca and Quetzalcoatl play a part in bringing music to earth. The phenomenal material world must ask the spirit or the mind to draw down the music from the sun. It cannot simply do it on its own, just as inert matter on its own does not produce music. But the mind can make music manifest in the world by using the physical materials that the natural world provides. In this way, the story is reminiscent of Thoth making the first lyre out of a tortoise shell. The physical world makes it possible to create music, but it is the mind that imagines music where before there was none, and conceives it into the world. The radiance and beauty of the musical harmonies, as well as the mathematical precision required to produce them, has associations in countless cultures with light and life, with the sun and with the heavens and the movements of the heavenly bodies, with reason, with truth, with logic and wisdom. By understanding harmony and consonance in music, humans would better understand the harmony that governed the cosmos and would come closer to achieving harmony in their own lives. Harmony in personal affairs, but also in societies, was achieved by being in consonance with the heavenly harmonies. We have already seen in part how such ideas developed in ancient Greek and ancient Chinese philosophy. You may remember from our discussion of equal temperament that the mythological origins of the empire of China itself were closely tied up with the birth of music. The figure of Linglung, music master to the first mythical emperor of China, the Yellow Emperor, was said to have heard the song of the male and the female phoenix and to have cut bamboo pipes that produced the same tones as those that he had heard in the song. And in this way, he derived the twelve perfect tones on which the orderly life of the first Chinese society was based. But over time, errors crept into the calculations of the music masters, and so the twelve tones used in the ritual musics of the court were no longer in perfect balance, planting the seed of disharmony. With so much at stake, the tuning of instruments had a central role in the ritual life of the Chinese courts. Now, it is easy to see why the study of music and the theory of harmonies was associated with such brilliant ideas of harmony and prosperity and truth and the sun. But this radiant conception of music tells only half of the story. Alongside this harmonious and rational understanding of music, there was a much deeper and more mysterious conception of music in the ancient world. In Greek mythology, even though it was the radiant Apollo who was the god of music and who was depicted as playing the lyre, it wasn't Apollo who was credited with inventing the lyre, but rather Hermes, or Hermes, a god who was reminiscent of the Egyptian Thoth, and who was in fact syncretized later with Thoth during the mingling of Egyptian and Greek cultures following the conquests of Alexander the Great. Now Hermes was the messenger of the gods, but again, reflecting the ambiguous nature of language, he was also a trickster god, and a protector of thieves and magicians. On the day that Hermes was born, while still a baby, 
he fashioned a lyre out of the shell of a tortoise and began to sing in honour of his father, Zeus, and his mother, the nymph Maya. Later on that day, he devised a plan to steal fifty cattle from Apollo. He waited till night, and while Apollo slept, he cut off fifty cows from the herd and made them walk backwards, so that the tracks would appear to lead to the herd rather than away from it. The next day, when Apollo was anxiously searching for his lost cattle, he found an old man, who told him he had seen a child driving cattle backwards in the night. Following the directions of the old man, he came upon Maya with the infant Hermes lying in his cradle, who had hidden all of the evidence of what he had done from his mother. When Apollo questioned him, Hermes replied that he was only a helpless baby and could not know of any such things because he had only been born yesterday. But Apollo was not convinced, and he took Hermes to Zeus, seeking judgment. When Hermes again repeated his defence in front of his father, Zeus simply laughed, because he knew what his son had been up to during the night. And he ordered Hermes to take Apollo to the place where he had hidden the cattle. Hermes obeyed, and when Apollo was reunited with his cattle, the two gods were reconciled. And to celebrate this, Hermes took out his lyre and began to sing. The music was so beautiful that Apollo was spellbound, and after listening he exclaimed that such a skill was easily worth fifty cows. And so Hermes gave Apollo the lyre, and deemed that he should become master of the arts of music. And in turn, Apollo made Hermes the messenger of the gods. And when Hermes pledged that he would never again steal from him, Apollo even gave him a golden whip that put him in charge of his herds, and a golden staff of friendship and prosperity, from which Hermes would fashion the Caduceus, the wand with the two entwined snakes. And even though Apollo couldn't share his gift of prophecy with Hermes, he told him of the Thrie, the sisters, who were the masters of the art of divination, and from whom Hermes would come in time to learn many prophecies. And this friendship between the two gods was sincere, but we can definitely say that Hermes did very well for himself in this exchange, and that Apollo, the light of reason itself, was in a way bewitched by music, so great was its beauty and power. This depiction of the persuasive power of music is similar in some ways to the Irish story of the Dagda's harp. When the Dagda played his harp, he could make his enemies fall to the ground weeping or laughing uncontrollably. He could stir his men to battle in an instant, and even held power over the natural world, arranging the order of the seasons by the playing of his harp. And even today, the Dagda's harp can be found everywhere in Ireland, from Guinness to Ryanair. Now the occult aspect of music in Greek culture ran very, very deep. The classical Olympian gods of ancient Greece that most people are familiar with represent the rational superstructure of public life. They're the religion of the intelligentsia and of politics, what we might call consensus culture. However, cultures are never monolithic entities. Alongside any orthodoxy, there are always underground cultures running just under the surface, and ideas can pass from one to the other. In Greece, there were a number of cults, which today are referred to as mystery cults, from the name which was given to the initiates, the mustes, those whose mouths are closed, a word which has its origins in the Proto-Indo-European root word May, which means to make small or to close. And the mouths of the initiates were closed, not just because they were keeping a secret, although that was part of it. Writing down or even speaking about what went on in these rites could be punishable by death, which is why, despite the fact that large numbers of people took part in these rites, even today we don't exactly know what happened during some of the greater mysteries but their mouths were closed also in the sense that the secret knowledge that they were initiated into was a form of knowledge that was beyond words. 
Simply put, what the initiates experienced could not be told. Now, the mystery cults were often deeply interested in ideas of the afterlife and conquering death, both of which had very little place in classical Olympian Greek religion. The origins of these mystery cults are very difficult to trace, however in Greece they are likely to have taken on the form in which we know them during the Greek Dark Ages in the centuries between the fall of the Mycenaean culture in 1100 BC and the rise of classical Greek culture in the 700s BC. But they have precedence in religious practices all around the Mediterranean, and even in the east in the Indus Valley, going back thousands of years prior to that. They likely evolved gradually out of very ancient agrarian cults, in which the cycles of the seasons and of the crops came to symbolise cycles of death and rebirth. They involved stories of journeys into the underworld and an interest in the fate of the soul after death. Over the course of antiquity, as civilizations developed and humans started to gaze within for the first time, we might say as they started to see themselves, to see themselves as separate from the world, rather than just to gaze out at the world, they also began to realise that the mysteries they observed in the world around them provided ways by which to understand the mysteries of the world they were coming to perceive within. Words and concepts that now have an almost exclusively internal meaning of separateness from the world, in a very remote past, had an external meaning. The Proto-Indo-European root words from which ancient Greek, Hebrew or Latin developed their words for spirit or soul, words such as pneuma and anima, once had external meaning. They were the wind or breath. Just as in Central America, Quetzalcoatl was the wind, but also the spirit and wisdom. The world experienced by our remote ancestors was one made of cycles, the earliest dying and rising gods known to mankind before Christ, before Osiris, before Persephone or Ishtar, were likely the earth itself and the sun. Even though to call them gods with all the cultural baggage that such terms have these days is a very unfit term to try and describe such an experience. Each year the seasons alternated, an abundance of food would be replaced by the harshness of the winter months until life once more returned to the earth with the coming of spring. And this cycle of death and rebirth was matched by the yearly cycle of the sun in the sky. And so to an extent, the sun became symbolic of this process. In fact, the sun entered the underworld, the world of darkness, each night, only to rise again each morning. And with its return, the world would seem to come alive again each dawn. In the night sky too, constellations moved in cycles, at times appearing to dip under the horizon, only to rise again a few months later. And in the natural world, out of the death of any living organism, came the life of others. Life came out of death, just as surely as death came out of life. These mysteries came to be associated in different forms with stories of death and rebirth, of a descent into and a subsequent ascent out of the underworld, on the part of a god or a hero. In fact, it is one of the many tropes of heroic literature that the hero must journey into the underworld before being allowed to complete his quest. And in this descent, the hero often gains knowledge of himself, of his past or of his future. And as humans started to gaze inwards and back into the mind, to enter into the mind, they found in there another mystery, so obscure and impenetrable that one might almost lose oneself entirely in such a darkness. So the stories that recounted the trials of a hero or a soul as it journeyed into the underworld also started to acquire a psychological aspect. They were a mirror for an inward journey into the depths of the mind. Initiates in the mystery cults were inducted into self-knowledge and knowledge of the world that lay beyond the physical through out-of-body experience, brought about by means of ecstatic rituals. Ecstasis literally means to stand outside. 
outside one's body. And these rituals made use of music and intoxicating substances. There has been much speculation on the degree to which psychedelics were a feature of such rituals. In a way, these rituals can be seen as being closer to shamanic practices found in other cultures in which a shaman communes with the spirit world by entering into a trance induced by the use of intoxicants and prolonged ritualistic chanting or music. Music was seen in this way as a manifestation in this world of the transcendent spiritual reality that lay beyond. You might remember what we said earlier about music being seen as a bridge. Music was the point in which the two worlds would come into contact and combined. By focusing the mind on the experience of music, the physical world would gradually lose its hold on the attention of the listener and fade away, elevating the mind, literally taking them places that could not be found in the material world alone. Among the Greek traditions, the centrality of music is most apparent in the religious practices of Orphism. This was a cult that developed around the mythical figure of Orpheus, who was said to have founded the mysteries of Dionysus. Now Dionysus, or Dionysos, was in origin a foreign god from Thrace, northeast of Greece. Now, like Zeus, Dionysus was probably initially a sky god and an all god. In fact, the two gods are cognates, that means they share a common etymological origin. In this case, the Proto-Indo-European root word dio, which means to shine, and is associated with the light of the sky. From this root dio, we get tseo of Zeus, and we get the dio of Dionysos, and we even get the Hindu Vedic god Diaushpitar, which literally means sky father, and Diaushpitar is a parallel etymological form to Zeus Pater, Zeus the father, and Jupiter, which is Jupiter, the Roman sky god. We also get the Devas in Buddhism and the Latin Deus, which simply means god. In fact, it is likely that initially the Greeks may have understood Dionysus simply as the Zeus of another tradition. The name Dionysos literally means Zeus Nisa, the Zeus of Nisa, of this other place. But once he was integrated into the Greek pantheon, he adopted a very specific role. He became the youngest of the sons of Zeus and a figure of redemption. He was the beauty that redeems the world. Now the songs attributed to Orpheus recount the story of how Dionysus was born out of an affair between Zeus and Semele, a Thracian princess. Zeus loved this child so deeply that he declared that he would bequeath his kingdom to him. His wife Hera was so insulted by this that she sought the help of the Titans in ridding her of the child. They lured the infant Dionysus into the woods with toys and with rattles. And they mocked him, they took his golden scepter and instead made him carry a stick of fennel. And then in a frenzy they ripped his body apart and devoured him. When Zeus saw this, he destroyed the titans with his thunder. But all that remained of Dionysus was his heart. Zeus took the heart and incubated it within his body. And Dionysus was reborn from Zeus's thigh several months later. And so for the Orphic initiates, the redemption offered by Dionysus, the twice-born, was also that of an eternal life after death. They would take part in the death and resurrection of Dionysus by richly devouring raw meat and blood, literally eating the body of their redeemer. And as always, accompanying and inducing the alternating states of abandonment and contemplation was music. The other figure worshipped by the Orphic initiates was the mythic founder of the rites himself, Orpheus, who they claimed was a son of Apollo and the greatest of the Greek musicians. 
he too had journeyed into the underworld after his wife had died from a snake bite. He entered into Hades with only his lyre, but such was the beauty of his music that none of the spirits could harm him. And when he came before Cerberus, the three-headed hound that guarded the underworld, the monstrous beast was soothed by the music and fell into a peaceful slumber. In the bowels of hell, Orpheus knelt before the throne of Hades himself and played his lament. And so great was the pain of the song that even the lord of the underworld wept and tears of iron fell from his eyes. Hades was moved to compassion and agreed to allow Orpheus to take his wife back to the overworld on the condition that he should not look at her until they had reached the realm of the living, for he would not allow him to see the face of the dead. So Orpheus ascended, with Eurydice following behind him, and as he walked, he could hear her footsteps behind him, and he played his lyre so that his music would protect them both. But just as he stepped out into the sunlight of the upper world, he suddenly couldn't hear her footsteps, so he turned around, but she was still inside the cavern. He saw her shade in the half-light and reached out to draw her to him, but she slipped through his fingers and back into the darkness. And so Orpheus was condemned to return to the world alone and in grief, and wandered for a time in the forests and other remote places. But in the end his pain was so deep that he sat down and played a song of such torment that it called the animals and beasts of the forest to him, and they devoured him, ending his suffering. In another version of the myth he is killed by the Maenads, who tear his body limb from limb, but in both cases his death echoes the death of Dionysus at the hands of the Titans. Now at the heart of this myth we find an image of troubling beauty. Throughout his journey out of the underworld, Orpheus can hear Eurydice and he knows that she is there, but she remains always just beyond his reach, just out of his field of vision, and in the end he cannot grasp her. On a simpler level, at a glance we can see that this myth tells us much about the understanding of music to the followers of Orpheus. Music is literally the means by which Orpheus is allowed to journey into the underworld, and his music holds power even over Hades himself. Now Pythagoras, who you should at least have a general idea of by now, was deeply influenced by Orphism. Some suppose that he was an Orphic initiate himself, and the way in which he would bring together the two aspects of culture we have been discussing, the rational on the one hand and the mystery on the other, the way he would bring these together in the philosophy that he constructed around the twin disciplines of music and mathematics would end up being part of what may have been the greatest shift in the history of Western thought to this day. And we will be looking at this shift and its impact up to the modern day in another video which will probably be called a geometry of sound and hopefully you'll see from that why i'm not going to go in depth on it today and why it really deserves to be treated as its own topic and its own episode now before we end today's discussion there is also another layer of ancient greek culture we should mention and that is the pastoral the rustic traditions of the people who lived in more rural areas as with the occult mysteries, these too were often very ancient traditions that evolved as they were passed down orally through the generations and whose origins are lost in the mists of time. These centred largely around the worship of spirits and beings that were believed to live in the forest and in other natural places, and around rituals of propitiation and healing that we would now associate with the domains of magic and superstition and folk remedies. The central deity of these traditions was Pan, a being who was half man and half goat, who was the god of the woodlands and the mountains and of music, especially of folk or rustic music. The Pan pipes are still associated with him today. He was a god of shepherds and flocks and also of fertility and sexuality. 
Being rustic cults, they were often associated with the very pragmatic needs and interests of hardy rural folk, and so Pan also has associations with worldly wisdom and the traditional knowledge that the old passed on to the young in each new generation. But again, this aspect too was not simply separate from the rest of Greek culture. In fact, the name Pan tells us that even he, like Zeus and Dionysus in a more distant past, was likely an all-god figure or a father figure or an image of the one from which emerge all things. The prefix Pan itself still means all today. And Pan too had his own mystery rites in Greece, because of course he had his own mystery rites, everyone did, even Apollo had mystery rites, in which his association with an ancient all-god, father-god status becomes much more explicit. In these rites he is often syncretized or identified with Dionysus or Zeus, who, as we have seen, could also sometimes be seen as being aspects of one and the same, and who also had a whole variety of interpretations and syncretisms of their own. And again, we find a similar complex richness of layers of traditions in other civilizations. Among the Aztecs, for example, even though music was said to have come from the sun, there also was a god of music, Wehwe Coyotl, and his name means the very ancient coyote, or literally old, old coyote. And he was a trickster god, and a god of uninhibited sexuality. The old, old coyote has associations with cunning and worldly wisdom, and his status as an ancient being indicates deep understanding and the knowledge of mysteries. In these and other aspects, he is very reminiscent of Pan. Now for today, this is where we'll have to leave our discussion of music in the ancient world. And hopefully these stories can give you a sense of how difficult it can be sometimes to try to unpick different elements of these traditions. We will be following it up in the next video when we will be looking at the idea of music as philosophy. This is not just the philosophy of music, which in a sense is simply the musings that arise out of thinking about the musical experience, which is what all of these videos are in a sense, but rather this is an understanding of music in which the actual practice of music and the experience of music themselves are seen as forms of philosophy in their own right. Now as a quick note to those of you who follow my videos, um, there's not a lot of you but I know there's some of you out there, um, I have decided that I will be uploading the emptiness of sound in full, which I played a brief clip from at the end of my last video. Um, so that probably will actually end up being the next video that I upload. And I'm also going to be taking some time out to work on some new recordings, but hopefully this shouldn't delay the next episode by too much because I already have um, a good chunk of the notes written for the following episode. So. Hopefully you'll be hearing again from me soon.